Okay, we are just on page 54 going over the arguments uh, that Jesus uses to justify his uh, breaking of the Sabbath. David did it. The priests do it. I desire a real thing like mercy instead of getting hung up on how many steps you can take. Uh, the uh, Mark column, the Sabbath was made for the benefit of man and consequently uh, man should benefit on the days of the Sabbath. And then finally, in verse 8 of the first column, Matthew, the Son of Man's Lord of Sabbath. He made up the rules, he can break the rules. So there are five wonderful arguments. I think the Lord was taking some thought about giving these arguments. He was loaded for bear. Now, the interesting thing, the next thing that happens, he went from there, uh, paragraph 58 on 54, and enters the synagogue, and behold, there's a man with a withered hand sitting on the front row. Can you put your hand up like a withered man, hand man? Just put it up like this, real high, put, yeah, real high, so everybody can see it. Real high, everybody up in the, up in the, up in the. That's it. I got a withered. I do have a withered hand. Isn't that pathetic? Yeah, he, he's sitting here like this. Now they put him here. They watched to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. They had put him right there in the front row of the synagogue. Jesus comes out, oh, what happened to your hand? Oh, I've been like this my whole life. It's a withered hand. I'm the withered hand man. And uh, <laughs> how'd you get such a good seat? Oh, they put me here. They wanted you to be sure to see this. And that's the truth of it. That's what's happening. And they asked him. It's like, hit me in the jaw. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. And... Jesus says to the man with the withered hand, withered hand man, come up here. Come here. Come, on. come up here with your withered hand. All right? Am I embarrassing you all together? What happened to your hand? It's withered. Come here. And he said to them, you just asked me, I'm going to ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill him? They went, mm. He said, what man of you? Any one of you would do this. If you have a sheep and it falls into the pit on the Sabbath, you don't go out and say, bah, 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 being interpreted is, it's the Sabbath, you're going to have to stay there till tomorrow, and I'll get you out tomorrow. So just hang on. Here's some water. Which one of you who has a sheep that falls into a pit will not break the Sabbath to get the sheep out? And they all knew they would, wouldn't you? Of how much more value is a man that has a sheep? Is a man than a sheep? <laughs> so it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath, I assume, from your silence. And I like this verse in, uh, in Mark. He looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. And Jesus is ticked. He looks around with anger, is dark eyes are just flashing. And he says, stretch out your hand. And his hand was restored. You can sit down now. Isn't that good? The Pharisees went out. <laughs> the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. Oh, how are things going? Is the Lord getting into the hearts of these? He's getting into their conscience, but he's sure not getting into their hearts. They are so angry. They have been backed into the, up against the wall. There's no place to go. They all know they would have taken their own sheep out of a ditch. And here they get this guy with a withered hand, maneuver him to the front row. After Jesus had just given, given this whole spiel on working on the Sabbath, they try to trap him again. And he makes a donkey out of them. Talk about donkeys in a ditch. The Pharisees were. He made them that. Now, when you're backed into a corner like they are, thrown into a ditch as they are, a logical ditch, you have some options. When, when your logical thought pattern has been demonstrated to be totally fallacious, what did I just say? When you've been proven to be wrong, logically, you have a couple of options. One of them is to do what? What's one of your options? Yeah, I'm wrong. You are right, Jesus. 
I wouldn't let my sheep stay down there for another day just because it happened to be the Sabbath. Man, are we stupid. You're exactly right. I repent. That's, that's one option. What's another option? Have you ever been disproven in a verbal confrontation and you could say, you're right, I'm sorry, or you could what? Yeah, get mad. Deny it. And they really got angry. They lost all, all sense of uh, appropriate action. They, said, they got together, the Herodians and the Pharisees got together and said, how are we going to kill this guy? We just can't kill him. We try to throw him over a cliff, he disappears. What's going on? We, how are we going to destroy this man? There's a nice religious motivation. Kill him. Now notice the Pharisees and the Herodians. Pharisees were the, uh, the equivalent of the evangelicals in their day. Uh, they were the conservatives. They were the literalists. They, they thought they really had it right in the Old Testament. Uh, out of which group came the Apostle Paul. They were not liberals, that's the Sadducees. The Herodians were the people who had sided with Herod. They were the status quo people in town. And the Herodians and the Pharisees didn't like one another. Pharisees would love to see everything restored to Israel. The Herodians says, don't rock the ship. It's okay, we have peace. Uh, Herods are doing all right, but all is doing okay, let's just let it be. But they're friends now because they have a common enemy. And the two of them say, how can we destroy this man? What can we do with this Jesus? Terrible response. Aware of this. Aware of this. When John the Baptist was in prison, what did Jesus do? Do you recall? He left. He took the secret route through Samaria, remember? Jews wouldn't go there. He heard John was arrested. He beats it. Jesus is very clever in the way he moves about. When things get hot, he moves on, gets out of there. He does it again. Look, Jesus aware of this, aware of what? That they're trying to kill him. Withdrew from there. He withdrew from Judea and Jerusalem. Uh, and people came from all those areas. And this was to fulfill... Uh, what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah that people would follow after him. On top of page, page 57, he went up into the hills. And uh, his disciples are there. And they came to him. He called to him those who he had desired, and they came to him. And what we begin here is a very long section, a very long paragraph, uh, after this introduction, called the Sermon on the Mount. It is uh, the Lord's uh, statement concerning how his disciples are to uh, function in the coming days. And he calls the twelve to himself. Uh, take this page that has the uh, Sermon on the Mount, and I want to explain that. But first of all, <coughs> he's going to call the twelve disciples, and this is this is called their ordination sermon. I think that's legitimate. He now focuses on who the twelve are. And I want you to get this straight on page 57. And I'll get that page in front of you. We'll refer to that directly. Let's do the Luke column. And we'll identify the twelve apostles that he names. Uh, You've got to be careful because there are, are numbers of names. Simon, whom he named Peter. It's Simon Peter. Simon Cephas, Peter. That's number one apostle, Peter. And his brother, Andrew. Peter and Andrew were brothers. Then you have two more brothers, James and John. You have Philip and Bartholomew. Bartholomew is Nathaniel by tradition. We don't run into Bartholomew except here, and we have met Nathaniel, and most link the two together. Nathaniel, Bartholomew, same guy. Matthew, Thomas, another James, James the son of Alphaeus, another Simon, 
He's called the Zealot. And Judas, the son of James, which James we do not know. And Judas Iscariot. Notice Judas Iscariot is the last in each list, a well-deserved position. And he is identified in each instance as the traitor. <coughs> now, to make it easier to understand, to remember, there are two who are named Judas, two who are named Simon, one being Simon Peter, and two named James. That makes it easier. There are two sets of brothers, Peter and Andrew, James and John. All four of them were in the fishing business. They were partners with Zebedee. They were from uh, Bethsaida. Peter, Andrew, and Philip are all from Bethsaida, one of the towns on the uh, Sea of Galilee. Judas is from a town probably called Cariot, K-E-R-I-O-T, in Judea. He is the only one who is not a Galilean. The Twelve Apostles. Judas will drop out uh, due to his uh, betrayal. In Acts 1, Matthias will be named to replace him as the 12th apostle. The apostle Paul being an exceptional apostle, as he himself identifies, born out of due time. So these 12, these 11 plus Nathaniel will sit on the 12 tribes, on the thrones of the 12 tribes of uh, Jacob, ruling over those 12 tribes of Israel in the millennium. The Lord will allude to that directly. They have a prominent uh, role in the coming kingdom. We also read in uh, Ephesians that we are built upon uh, the apostles and prophets. These are the apostles of the church as well. They have a dual role. They are our foundation built upon the apostles and prophets. Sir? So, these 12 including Judas? Or Matthias take his place on the 12 thrones? For the thrones? Yeah. These 12 minus Judas plus Matthias. Yeah. That's the way I would come in. Now, some people say Matthias was a mistake and Paul really is that one. But there's no indication of that in the book of Acts. So we say, these 12 minus Judas plus Matthias, Paul is an exception. My view of Paul would be, and he calls himself the apostle to the Gentiles. He will have a role in relation in the, in the, in the millennium, I think, uh, to ruling over the Gentile powers, as these will over the Jewish tribes, as well as a dual responsibility in relationship to the church. Okay, so these are the 12. And then what, what follows is the Sermon on the Mount. Two things about the Sermon. Let's look, first of all, at the Sermon on the Mount and where do we, what kind of application, where does the Sermon on the Mount fit literally? There are a number of views that come, of coming on the Sermon on the Mount. This is probably the world's best-known sermon. Uh, it's a beautiful sermon. It's got an introduction and conclusion, three main points. I'll uh, point that out to you. Uh, it, it's a wonderful sermon, and, and we'll understand that. It's very well known. Most people, most people in the world uh, of, the, of Christendom would say the Sermon on the Mount is a rule of life uh, for salvation. The golden rule is in the Sermon on the Mount. Do you know what the golden rule is? It's a great rule. What is it? What was that? That's right. And if you do that, you're on your way to heaven. That's a works statement. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And that's a wonderful statement. That is a summary of one of the sections. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The golden rule. And if you live that way, and people say, you know, I live according to the golden rule. I don't know if they say it anymore. But that was a common statement in my day. I live according to the golden rule. That's just what Jesus taught us. It's right there in the Sermon on the Mount. The problem is none of us live according to the golden rule perfectly. And Jesus will, uh, will, will say, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, I've done that. No, you don't. We don't love our neighbors as ourselves. And he proves that. 
It's not a way of salvation. <coughs> uh, some will say, old dispensationalists would say, that the Sermon on the Mount is the uh, rule of life for the millennium. This is how it will be in the millennium. These are the principles that will be in play in the millennium. <coughs> and uh, that makes for a kind of murky millennium because people are persecuting you and causing you to go an extra mile. It really doesn't sound like the millennium. People will say it's the rule of life for a Christian, any follower of Jesus Christ. The things that are taught here are things that uh, we should do. Like if you have two coats, sell one. Give it to the poor. Gets a little tricky. Uh, there's advice given that is not the same kind of advice that appears in the epistles. So what is it? Well, this is the way I think we should come at it. It is called the interim ethic. What in the wide world could interim ethic mean? What does ethic mean? Well, ethic means a rule of life. This is how we conduct ourselves. This is uh, the ethic that is in place, the big ethic that is in place. When? What does interim mean? Interim. Right. In between here and there. And this is what we need to understand. Jesus is talking to his disciples, to the apostles, to the heralds of the kingdom. And he is saying, this is the way I want you to live in between the offer of the kingdom and the establishment of the kingdom. When the gospel of the kingdom is being preached, this is the rule of life for the people preaching it. The interim ethic, in between the offer of the kingdom and its establishment. Now that becomes an important concept. In other words, he's saying, guys, you're going around saying what you're going to be doing now that we're into this Galilean ministry. In Galilee, you're going to be saying, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Judea, you're going to be saying, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Kingdom of God's at hand. In Perea, you'll be saying, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. This is how you're supposed to live when we're offering the kingdom to people. The end of his life, when he's standing uh, on Tuesday of Passion Week, he will say, the kingdom is taken from you. He will say uh, to his apostles, you remember when I tell, told you to do this, thus and so? Well, now I'm saying, forget that. If you don't have a sword, go get one. Because you're going to be identified with transgressors. You're going to be a hunted outlaw, just like I am now. They're coming for me now. And I'm changing my instruction to you. It's so clear in other areas. In the whole life of Christ, we'll see this very clearly. Go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. By the time he's done, he says, Great Commission. What's he saying the Great Commission? You know that. What's he saying the Great Commission? Go into all the world. Here he says, I've come only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Change that. Now go into all the world. Oh, with a little different message, we'll find out. A message relating to the church, not to the kingdom. In the Olivet Discourse that takes place on Tuesday, the Olivet Discourse is the discourse on prophecy. Jesus gets into the discussion of the tribulation. Are you all familiar with that? Seven years tribulation. And in the tribulation period, it says, then the gospel of the kingdom will be preached. Same gospel that Jesus is preaching. They will be saying then in the tribulation, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. This time it will come. So the Sermon on the Mount finds direct application in that intermethic when the kingdom is being offered and before it comes. That's in the life of the apostles until Jesus says, the offer's off. And as he prophesies, that same gospel, the kingdom, will be preached in the tribulation period, and this will be the rule of life for the tribulation. Two places where it applies directly. The intermethic, when the apostles are there, 
uh, preaching, repent, the kingdom is at hand, likewise uh, in the tribulation period. That does not mean that there are no principles in this great sermon for us. There are things that are true of all disciples of Jesus Christ. And Jesus commissions the disciples, the apostles, to go and make disciples, teaching us all the things that he has taught them. So what he teaches in principle still is true for us, just like the Old Testament. But the specifics may not be. The principle is. The specific may not be. That will come clearer as we uh, get into the uh, sermon itself. You will find, I'll get stuck in this sermon. There's so many things that are so real for all disciples of Jesus as a principle of life in the Sermon on the Mount. But he's telling these guys, look, this is the way you're supposed to live while you're going about offering the kingdom. Don't make provision for yourself. If you have <coughs> extra clothing, you don't, you don't need that. Uh, you're supposed to go forth as heralds of the king. If you come into a city, uh, they're supposed to provide for you. You don't have to do that. The Apostle Paul will say, no, if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. So there, there's a different kind of a setting. They're going forth as messengers of the king. And the messengers of the king should live off of the people of the kingdom. They will even ask that question, Jesus, do, do your apostles pay the tax? And Jesus will respond by, by saying, yes, we do. And Peter, they ask Peter, and Peter says, well, you know, you really shouldn't have to pay tax. I'm the king. King doesn't pay taxes, but in order to solve a problem, go catch a fish with two shekels. With a shekel, and you can pay your tax and my tax out of that. But in reality, that wasn't a necessity. He's the king. Kings don't pay, pay taxes. What do kings do? Collect taxes. So there's a big concept. Are there any questions on this? This is a big concept to get hold of. Sermon on the Mount, directly to the apostles then, directly to the people who will be preaching the gospel of the kingdom in the tribulation period, by application of principle to us. We principalize the whole Bible. Get the principle out of every lesson in the Bible and adapt it to the period of time in which we will live. Any, do we all understand what I'm saying there? Is that clear? It's a big concept to get hold of. It's not a way of salvation, Sermon on the Mount. It's not the rule of life in the millennium. It's not the rule of life for the Christian in, in, the, in the church. It is the rule of life for the apostles when the kingdom is being offered. It is the rule of life for the folk in the tribulation who will be preaching the same gospel of the kingdom, repent, the kingdom is at hand. It will be the rule of life for them as well. It fits perfectly. And we get principles out of it, just like we do out of any section of the Bible. I am not saying do not think I am saying that this Sermon on the Mount has nothing to do with us. It has plenty to do with us. Just like the Old Testament has plenty to do with us. It is very helpful if we read the Gospels as though we were reading the Old Testament. And we read the epistles as directly applying to us, the church. Okay? So... The sermon is divided this way. There is the introduction. We'll look at that today. The introduction, some of it at least. And then there are three breakdowns. The attitude to the law. This is on your second sheet. The attitude to the law. The attitude to self. The attitude to others. And then an invitation and conclusion at the end. It's a perfect sermon. Three main points. Lots of illustrations summary statement at the end of each main point. That's the way a sermon should go. So you go out with the big idea. The big idea is, this is the way we're supposed to live. In the first section, under the attitudes to the law, therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. There's a nice summary statement. This is what it says. This is what it means. Be that way. Attitude to self. And this takes up things like money and clothing and food and all those kind of things. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Attitude toward others, this is where the sermon, the, the uh, golden rule comes. Whatever you wish men to do to you, do also to them. 
It's a beautiful sermon. It starts out with a wonderful introduction. <coughs> Many of you ever heard of Beatitudes? This is where it comes from. It's a great introduction to this sermon. He's saying, you are blessed people. You're to be congratulated. You're a happy folk. Because, <coughs> excuse me. This is what awaits you in the kingdom. This is the way it's going to be when the kingdom comes. Well, they were offering it right then. And they were saying, this is right around the corner. I, I just started a day in the uh, Life of Christ book I'm, I'm reading. started yesterday, actually, the uh, triumphal entry passage. And they can taste it. They are so excited. Uh, they'll go in on Sunday and they'll say, Blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord to sit on the throne of David, his father. And the whole town is going crazy about the coming of the king. That's what they're anticipating as they're going around. Finally, there is victory at the end, it seems. And the kingdom is going to be there. This is what it's going to be like when the kingdom comes. And the Lord is saying to them, I want you to know how, how marvelous it's going to be when the kingdom gets here. You're going to be going around in Galilee and then Judea and then Perea saying, repent, the kingdom's at hand. When Israel accepts the kingdom, it's going to be a wonderful time. And this is what's going to happen. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It goes like this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who have turned to Jesus out of their personal spiritual poverty. For these believers will be citizens of the kingdom. You have believed me. You have come to understand your own spiritual poverty. You have become a believer and a follower of me. You will be a citizen of the kingdom. Yours is the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God in the Luke account. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. Those who have acknowledged and confessed their own sins. For God will comfort them, turning mourning into joy in his kingdom. Think of how wonderful it will be to come into a kingdom where the consequences of sin on creation have been reversed. And the lamb and the lion will lie down together and there will be perfect peace. Your mourning will be turned into joy. Blessed are the meek, those who do not assert their rights, for they will inherit the earth and rule with Christ in his coming kingdom. This demonstrates clearly that it is not a a segment that applies to us in our day. You try being meek in the business world and see where that gets you. You're not going to inherit anything. You have to be aggressive and assertive. You ladies have been taught to be assertive, haven't you? That's part of the new woman. You know, Ooh, uh, I'm a lady, I can't speak. I am a woman with all the rights and privileges of humanity. You know, out of my way. Have you been taught that? You have been taught that. And Jesus, you know, Jesus gives a whole new meaning to the word humility. Humility was a vice. The word humble in, in the Greek of that day showed a weak person. A humble person now is a strong person. I saw on a sign at the, uh, the Bible church, they have great signs up. If you think meek is being weak, try being meek for a week. <laughs> Isn't that a good statement? If you think meek is being weak, try being meek for a week. And you find out that's a really strong person, under control, but not assertive. You're not the person pushing in line. You're not the driving your car so fast and get, a, you know, get one place ahead of the guy at the red light. Meek do not inherit the earth. Hitler inherits the earth. Stalin inherits the earth. Mao inherits the earth. Did you hear that? They, they put, uh, it's the, uh, 
60th anniversary of the beginning of communism in, in China, and they put the colored lights on the Empire State Building last uh, week celebrating that, the, the red and gold, I think, celebrating 60 years of communism. They were prep people. Communists who had come to our uh, uh, Chinese who had come to our country were down below protesting it. And well, they should. Well, Mao killed so many people. It makes Hitler look like an amateur, as did Stalin. Stalin and Mao killed more people than Hitler did. We just don't think about that much. The meek don't inherit the earth. The guy with the biggest weaponry inherits the earth. That's the way it is. And that's true in everyday life. The meek. And Jesus says, you'll inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, those who don't say, I have rights. For they will inherit the earth and rule with Christ in his coming kingdom. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those who are disappointed in the unjust practice of religious and political government. Are you disappointed with the practice of religious and political government in the world? It's a frustration. No matter when you live, it's a frustration. For they will be satisfied when the priest king rules in his kingdom. Blessed are the merciful, those who are compassionate and caring. For they will be twice blessed, both now and in the coming kingdom. In that statement I just read, I am alluding to a passage from Shakespeare. Do you know it? Blessed are the merciful, those who are compassionate and caring, for they will be twice blessed, both now and in the coming kingdom. Can any of you find that? Two extra points in the quiz if you can identify the Shakespearean play from which, what is it? No. The Merchant of Venice. How's it go? Is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives, and him that re blesses he who gives and he who receives. The quality of mercy is not string. They'll be twice blessed. The person who gives it will be blessed, and the person who receives it will be blessed. Two extra points. Those who are compassionate and caring, for they will be twice blessed, both now and in the coming day when mercy will be demonstrated to them in a special way in that coming kingdom. Blessed are the pure in heart, those who have loved their God as a single priority of life, for they will see God manifested in his transfiguration glory in the coming kingdom. They shall see God, they'll see Jesus Christ transfigured before them for the whole thousand years. We will see that. Won't that be great? See what I'm doing now? I'm slipping into, this applies to me too. Because we're going to be in the millennium as well. But I'm putting a millennial twist to every one of these. This is what it's going to be like when the kingdom comes. Blessed are the peacemakers. Those who proclaim the message of peace with God and of the coming rule of the Prince of Peace. For they will be acknowledged as the sons of God in his peaceful kingdom. These are people who are just like I am. The king of peace. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Those whose message of reconciliation brings retaliation. For they will be honored citizens of the kingdom where righteousness rules. And then a general statement. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely. You whose message of reconciliation brings open hatred and vicious personal attacks. For you join the faithful prophets who were so treated before you. And you receive an even greater reward proportional to your suffering in the kingdom where righteousness rules. You see, the kingdom is the reward for people who follow Jesus' preaching, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. All these things are our future as well. Because he has made us a kingdom of priests in the church. 
and we shall rule with him on the earth. We will enter into the blessings of the millennium now. These blessings don't necessarily come to us in the church era. We will not inherit the earth now. We will later. Just like these folk who are offering the kingdom don't have it in the interim, they have it later. Do you see how this works? doesn't rob us of the truth of it, but we put it in its right place. Is that clear? All relates to the kingdom. All relates to the kingdom. Then he says, you're the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Salt has two purposes, to give flavor and to preserve. And uh, they are to preserve. Their message is a message of preservation, and it it makes life palatable as well if we live by the righteous standards of the king. The light of the world, it shines in a dark place. It, pre, it, it tells the truth of the revelation of God. These are what the apostles will be doing then. It is what we do as well now. Then before getting into the body, after this introduction, he makes this statement as he will go to the law itself. Think not that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to destroy that. I've come to go to the heart of it. Mm -hmm.